presented first. In the beginning. We've heard the story multiple times uh, about the beginning. It's a little summary of that moment in Genesis, you know, chapters one and two leading up to chapter three. After Adam and Eve ate from an apple, we know what comes next, right? Genesis three, verses nine to ten. Jesus is coming back. And this is what happens. The Lord God called to humankind, where are you? And he replied, I'd heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. It's really amazing to, to have kids. Let's work, you lose sleep, but it's so cool to have kids. It reminds me a lot of my, my time being a kid, and I was like, poor my parents. What must I have gotten go through so many things? My kids are in that age where they love to ask questions about how things work, just in general. Seven and nine years old, right? And just at that moment. And there are some questions that even now I don't have an answer for them. Some of them are biblical questions, right? And I encourage them to like find your Bible or find a book, find something where you can write all the questions you want to ask Jesus when we go to heaven. Now, at my age, I have like a million and one questions that I want to ask him. But one of the questions that I have and that I started to think about when I was asked to preach today is, how did Adam and Eve not know they were naked? We, they spent all this time in the Garden of Eve. And right. Was it just so beautiful that they, they didn't notice, they didn't pay attention to it? 
What happened when there was sin that introduced them to their nakedness? It's one of the things I'll be looking forward, again, probably a million and two questions at some point. Now, Ellen G. White does tell us a little bit more, but I still have more questions, right? So whenever in doubt, you read the Bible, you pray, it's great to have that ex extra light and this inspired word. And if you guys, ah, here it is. I was looking for this. <laughs> no worries. In the book, Last Day Events, right, we see that Ellen G. White tells us that the eyes of Adam and Eve were indeed open, but to what? They saw their own shame and ruin to realize that the garments of heavenly light that had been their protection were no long, wrong, longer around them as a safeguard. Their eyes were open to see that nakedness was the fruit of transgression. So it, it seems to, to be that when we are close to God, when we have that close connection to Jesus, we have this garment of light around us. And it's perhaps this garment, when there's the transgression of sin, that is lifted. And at that moment, they saw their nakedness and they were afraid. Looking into the Hebrew word and at other translations, both English, Spanish, and Portuguese, right? There's a, a different word that sometimes is utilized instead of afraid. And that's the word shame. Now, may... Fantastic month. In this setting, Maine is known for graduation, which is exciting, right? But I'm a psychotherapist, and I also enjoy May because it's Mental Health Awareness Month. Shame is a very particular emotion that really hinders progress, really hinders growth. Now, in my field, uh, we can talk about all of these concepts for hours and hours. My, my, my poor wife probably knows what I'm talking about. It's like, is there gonna be other psychotherapists there? We have a couple of friends. It's like, all right, I'll just have to wait till you guys go talk and talk around in circles, what it appears to be. Um, there's a lot of debate. We don't, we don't understand fully what happens in our emotional reactions, right? There's different theories about how emotions work. As we have advancements uh, in neuroscience, we get a little better understanding of what is happening uh, in our brain. But we can see the effects, even though we have some difficulty really understanding emotions, fear, anxiety, anger, sadness, joy, shame, guilt. We can see the effects it has on people's lives in their relationships with others, in the work, in their study. We are able to observe how guilt and shame really play a barrier, very significant barrier, to growth and development. When we think about shame, we must think about knowing that we have done something wrong. Adam and Eve, at the moment that they ate the apple, is one of the newer developments that they came to start understanding. Now, being afraid may have been new to them, right? This is something that they had a reaction, a reflex, right? That's what we think a lot when we think about emotions, right? We, we feel them and here comes a reaction without necessarily uh, thinking about what we're doing. This is my a, thousand, a million and three questions, right? I keep adding more. But this is the area, the limbic system. Oh, goodness. We have a magnificent brain that was created by God so that we could engage and connect with him, right? The emotional reactions that we have typically occur in, in this area, right? We have the hippotampus, the amygdala. It's, it's a very complex, beautiful system that we have a lot more questions than we can have answers, right? 
But one of the things that we started to understand a little bit better is that to be aware of our reactions, right? We need to tap into that prefrontal cortex area, right? We start to know a lot better about this area a while back ago. It's where our executive functions, our decision making, our logical area comes into place, right? We, some of you may be aware of that. We have a lot of people in the educational field. It's very crucial to learning as well. But sometimes it goes offline. It just, we look back, how did I get here? From over there, right? And a lot of times that reaction, that reflex, has to do more with us being pushed by an emotional reaction. So what does shame do? As we read in Genesis, I don't need to go to my Psych 101 textbooks anymore. I can go to something that was written thousands of years ago. When we experience shame, we hide. And it's curious, right? Sometimes fear, which helps us navigate danger, right? Sometimes fear really allows us to get away from dangerous situations, right? But shame makes us go away from the people that care about us, for the people that are interested in our well-being. I think this is where the enemy really, really did its, its job, right? How do I keep separating humankind from my relationship with God, but making them feel shame? We see this over and over, right? It's a beautiful children's story. I didn't know that that was going to be the story, right? What was Ryan? I think it was maybe the name of, of, of the kid in that story, right? He did something that he was ashamed of. His grandmother loved him, wanted to give him that forgiveness, yet he couldn't come to tell his grandmother about what he had done. Now, I don't think anybody here is an Android, an, an IA, I think all of us here are human beings, so we must have experienced shame at some point in our lives. And it's interesting to think how we react when we feel that. There's uh, an anterior circulate cortex right there in the limbic system, right? That green part where it says single gyrus, right? That's one of the components that when it's activated, it draws all our neurological resources away from every single part of our brain. Now with the fMRIs and newer technology, we can see real time what's going on in people's brains, right? We, we show them a picture, they, they seem to be happy, this area is turned on. Uh, we tell them to do uh, some math problems, we see a different area. We ask them about recall, you know, history, memory stuff. Another area, we tell them, okay, now don't tell me, write it. Different parts of the brain turns on. We also like to have fun, although it doesn't look like as psychologists, we may come across as very serious. But to us, these are kind of like the fun uh, little things we, we like to do. We like to see how people react to stress because it's so surprising. I know, I know. It's funny to us, it's curious. But we also want to help people navigate those reactions. We can't change what we don't know. So a lot of times we have to surprise people. We may have uh, in, in the research labs, we may have people doing some of these various tasks that I've told you. And then out of the blue, we show them a scary picture, right? And what do people do? They, they startle, they can't hide, right? But they just, we, we literally see them jump back. But what's fascinating at the brain level whatever area of the brain they've been utilizing for the task goes offline, you know? You see those, those MRIs that kind of go from blue to red depending on the intensity, it goes dark blue. And what lights up is this area, the area of our emotions. It's quite interesting that we cannot use what we know once we enter this reaction. 
once our limbic system turns on, it's quite difficult to use skills that we may have, call people that we may know, reach out. We are completely using this area only. Now, I can go more into detail for hour, literally hours and hours, talking about parasympathetic and sympathetic responses, most commonly long, rest and digest, or the flight or fright. You've heard those. Those are a little bit more common, but I won't go into too much detail. The reason in my field we often explore to surprise people and see how they react to unexpected things, it's because that's when we notice how they cope. Coping is that way of trying to solve things, things that you didn't plan for, things that were unexpected. We all are coping even though we may be aware or unaware. Our reflexes are a way of coping with unexpected situations. Once we see that, we can say, all right, this is a very helpful way of responding to situations that are difficult, to situations that are unexpected, to fear, to shame, to anger. We see all of those things. When we talk about coping, it's interesting that we learn this very early on. To access all of these skills, there needs to be one quality that if it's absent, we can learn all about it, you can become a professional like me, and we still won't be able to access them. And that is a sense of security, a sense of safety. That sense of safety is really what helps us go away from that, uh, that reaction of survival, right? Fear of flight, reaction, and it calms down this area. This whole system that I have on this screen, once we feel safe and secure, it reduces in intensity, and then the rest of our brain kind of comes off online, right? It's a way of describing it, right? We can tap into all of these other areas, all these different skills, memories, resources, once we feel safe and secure. In my job, we understand that. We work really hard at trying to provide a sense of safety and security. It's not always easy. Um, a lot of times, we call this skill set, this area, grounding techniques. They can go by a lot of different names, right? Um, there are different, different approaches that you can help somebody feel safe and secure. But at the end, that's really what we are after. And it's so interesting that this sense of safe and security starts when we are born. That number one element that babies do is what? What do babies do? They cry. They cry. They are starting to figure out this world. And they don't know anything. And when we don't know anything, a lot of times, there's fear. And the reaction to fear is crying. What, it, what typically happens when a baby's crying? Here comes somebody to the rescue, checks them out, picks them up, smells the diaper, right? Oh, no, not that. That's fine. Is it hungry? What does it need? we start looking after the baby's needs. That starts creating a sense of safety and security that I don't know what's going on in this thing. It looks like a crib. Then they figure that out. They start exploring, and whenever they feel fear, they know that there's a caregiver, a parent, a grandparent to look after them. They start to learn that when there is danger, when there's something that they don't know, there's somebody who's going to be to protect them. Whenever this starts to wane, whenever there are challenges, whenever there are difficulties, and that sense of security is threatened, we see a lot of coping methods that are not always the healthiest way of responding. We see it in school. 
by the way, what a responsibility do we have here this, in this church where we have so many teachers, so many professors who, depending on the jobs that we have, they might see our kids more than we, we do sometimes, right? They are hearing, they are looking after our kids, right? I know we're going to be losing a couple of, of teachers, so we want to pray for them. We're also gaining some new teachers. By the way, is Darlene Markovich around here? I don't, I heard she might have been here. I guess not. We were, oh yes, oh, can you just raise your hand a little bit? Darlene, welcome. She's going to be a new teacher here at TCE. Please pray, pray for our teachers, those who are coming, those who are leaving, right? They're constantly working with our children to provide them that sense of safety and security, right? At home, at school, at church. One of the very interesting things that happen is that I, I do ca get calls, you know, for parents, especially after the pandemic. Well, I guess we're still in the pandemic, right? With concerns about their children, right? How anxious they become uh, during this pandemic, right? It's been a very difficult uh, thing to navigate. A lot of things change. That structure that kids don't often like, we know it's really helpful at providing that sense of security. And it was disrupted for them. And they're starting to navigate uh, their own feelings, their own understanding about what to make of all of these changes. Sometimes our young people often tell me that they don't want to share the things that they share with me with others, their parents, their teachers. Because guess what do they feel? They feel shame. This is the enemy's way of separating people from those who care about them. This is what he does to us to separate us from the Heavenly Father. He did it to Adam and Eve right there. I mean, these are people who walk with Jesus, with Christ, with God. And yet, once they separated themselves, and they did, they transgressed the law, they felt shame that they hid because they were scared. We have to understand that after the fall of humankind, right, all of these emotional elements have really disrupted our ability to build relationships. But emotions are not good or bad. They were, they were designed by, by our creator. Jesus, who never sinned, experienced all sorts of emotions. Emotions help us connect with other people. That's what really allows us to establish what we often called a bond. I'm a science teacher. I was going to go into an example of chemical bonds, and I was like, Whoo, this is, I don't remember my high school chemistry, so I'd rather not get into it uh, as an example. But we also can talk about human bonds, those human relationships that we have. And even though sin separated us from God and created that separation, it threatened that bond, that bond can be restored, right? Here we're going to look, see what Revelation 16, 15 says. And it says, look, I will come as unexpectedly as a thief, and blessed are all who are watching for me, who keep their clothing ready so they will not have to walk around is this is in Genesis, naked and ashamed. This is also where Ellen G. White is kind of quoting and referencing that, that clothing of lining, right? Those who are in a relationship with God, those who have a strong bond with God, are covered by his Holy Spirit, are covered by this light that comes from God. We no longer have to feel ashamed. Doing the work that I do is very rewarding, but also quite challenging, right? When we talk about, uh, with people about the different ways that you know, they react when they feel shame, certain emotions, we, we start finding healthier ways for them to utilize it. But it's still a challenge and takes repetition. It takes practice. But one of the fascinating things that I've observed over the 
14, 15 years that I've been working in the field, is that whenever I get to practice my profession out of a Christian perspective, right, when I work with somebody who believes in Christ, we start delving into these issues that just cause them to be afraid, cause them shame. And very quickly, we, we start remembering certain texts. There are so many. I just picked a couple uh, for today's sermon, right? And one of them is this. What inspired the title for today? Psalms 91, chapter 91, verses 1 and 2 says, Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadows of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. When, whenever we feel that sense of security threatened for whatever circumstances, right? It's not just young people who struggle with feeling safe and secure. As adults, we still experience all of these emotions, right? We have learned different ways. Sometimes we just ignore them, right? But we've learned different ways to tackle these emotions. But they take a lot of energy. There's somebody who's so powerful and he's willing, just standing out his hand, come to me whenever you're tired, whenever the situations are difficult, you can come to me. What gets in the way of us coming to Jesus? A lot of times is that shame that we don't feel worthy of his love. That is the devil's most deceitful lie. He keeps telling me, oh, remember the duck. Remember the whatever's in your past. Remember this. And all of a sudden, that limbic system fires up. We've read the scriptures, John 3.16. We know it by memory. We come to TCE, TEA. And yet, we react and we hide. We isolate. We don't share with other people what we're going through. We don't even share with our parents or with God because we feel ashamed. So it requires a lot of work for us to really understand what's going on and remember and claim and bring ourselves to this refuge. What helps us feel safe and secure? Once we connect with God, we'll feel that safety and that security and we can move forward. He'll embrace us. We are worthy. You are worthy, no matter what happened, no matter what the dog is in your life, no matter what the enemy is telling you, you are worthy. One of the challenges that we have here in this wonderful community is once we do that work for ourselves, how do we present that love to other people. I'm telling you, kids are going through a lot of things, members of our community are going through a lot of things, yet it is often difficulty for us to share them. I mean, if we turn on, off the, the internet session over there, and I just said, who's ready to come up here and tell us something they're ashamed of? I don't, I don't expect somebody to be able to do that because it's difficult, although we just spend a couple of minutes explaining that in Christ, in God, we have refuge. But it's still difficult to do. That got me thinking, wait, I've had all these years, people come to me, they tell me all of these things that they, they feel ashamed for, and not just that, not just individually. I also lead psychotherapy groups. Now, those of you who don't know what a psychotherapy group, it's got different modalities. There's a lot of different ways you can lead groups. Their focus can be uh, all different things. But one thing in common that those psychotherapy groups have is they have 
group rules. When we start a group, these are complete strangers. Yet, after a couple of sessions, they open up. They no longer feel ashamed. They are able to share what afflicts them. Now, these are not extensive. This is not, these are not written in stone like the Ten Commandments, right? So uh, depending on how you run groups, you'll, um, uh, we'll see different types of rules. But in my professional experience, I want to highlight two things from this approach that I think are very crucial and I would like us to keep in mind as we prepare for the summer and then another school year. This community in Christ needs to be a safe place for people to share their troubles. We in psychotherapy, we go to therapists. We talk about what's going on because if we don't talk about our issues, a patient's gonna come to us, they're gonna tell something, and you've heard this word, it's gonna trigger that limbic system. Even though I have all these years, I have all the experience, if I have not addressed what is going on in me, my past, anytime I'm experienced with somebody else, it's going to trigger me. So we have to do our work first, see God, find our refuge. So that in this community, when we have kids come to us, when we have other people join us, we can provide that sense of safety. That first one. This is the one that I hear for, from, from the youth and from people who are not believers, right? They, they come tell us, but you guys sound so judgmental. Don't do this, don't do that, why? Yes, we follow God's law, we follow the Bible. We just talked about what happens with that, that cover of lightning, the separation, sin, not following the rules. Yet, did God come judging Adam and Eve? He came with love. That is the commandment. We must love God so that we can feel worthy and come to him, be clothed in his light by the Holy Spirit. And then when we encounter others, not to judge them. Hear them out. Understand that they have a different journey. Their walk in Christ is not going to look like our walk. How do you avoid judgment? That's what, okay, well, how, we call that validation, right? What does validation quickly look like? It doesn't mean we agree. It was like, okay, it's okay that you, you copied on your exam. It's okay that you lied. We tell them, how do you feel? What's going on with you? Okay, I hear that you might be scared, that you were frustrated. Whatever they tell us, we have to pay attention to each other's emotional reactions. But what do we typically do? We feel an emotion and we isolate. We hide our emotions. Can we create a community where it's okay to express how we feel? Because once we express how we feel and we're not afraid of judgment, we can open up, we can understand one another, we can support each other and we can find refuge in Christ, in a community of Christ. Keeping somebody's journey, somebody's struggle confidential, keeping it to ourselves, unless they tell us, yes, I need more help, please go on, and sharing that love, that validation, that understanding that even though we may not really understand or we might disagree, we are still reacting out of love. And if you find yourself struggling with validation, with not judging when somebody tells you something, it's most likely something to do with what you've experienced in the past. And that's okay. You don't have to do all the work alone. The beautiful thing is that all we have to do is open ourselves to Jesus. Feel that refuge, feel the Holy Spirit, 
And that's our journey that's going to allow us to be a safe place where we can share what's really going on, when we can open up and have an honest conversation. George, if you can help me with this one. video. Second to last slide. If you just want to hit percent, I can guide it back to the slide that we need to. There we go. Previous one. That's okay, we'll leave it for another presentation. One of the highlights of that um, moment that I wanted to encourage you, right, is to feel comfortable with the emotions that you may experience. That's part of our human experience. Oh, I guess. Thank you. Go for it. I am a fight before the sword, the tremors in the spear shaft. I craft my way through blazes of fire steels, absorb the failings of deadened ends to render the floors I dance upon. I am the spaces between the pools, the roars of hearts running through heaven's walls. I breathe the forms of light and silence, still the course of cosmic riots. I am the glory of the giants, Manasseh, Sagamatha, watchmen of the Asian plains. They heed my name, made famous through the cries of albatross flocks, inflamed in Pacific fires. I am dressed in the spray of Nevada jewels, clothed in the shadows of Sahara caves. I am the light of lunar flames, fleshy the veins of Amazonia. I paint the trains of Antarctic quests, release the million to desert Panathera. I authorize the remains of Aztec and Inca that bloom through the visions of mountain tribes. I ride the skylight, read the signs, ignite the paths of astronomy's eyes. I am the unheard, heard in the 
I encourage you to seek Adonai, to seek Yahweh, to seek God, to seek Jesus. In any of those moments, whatever the shame, whatever the guilt is, we find safety, we find refuge in Christ. The last verse that I'll read today is in Psalm 62, 5, and it says, Let all that I am await quietly before God. For my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will not be shaken. As we struggle to find safety in this chaotic world, we have our rock, we have our fortress in Jesus Christ. Let us spend time there every single day and he will certainly transform our ability to create this wonderful community, a community where people feel safe and welcome. Let's bow our hands for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for that love, that wonderful, amazing, unbelievable love that you have for all of us. Through that love, we can redeem ourselves. We can reconnect with you. We can build a relationship where our past is forgiven. We can learn from it, we can use it to help others, but we will no longer need to feel ashamed. Help us draw us close to you so that we may feel that safety and security and that through your love, we can reach our young people, we can reach our family, our friends, this community where your love can shine through us and they can come and know that in you we are safe and secure. I pray all of this not because we can earn it, not because we can learn it, figure it out, but we pray this 